Graphs. I love graphs. That is, as long as they're understandable and don't look like a bowl of spaghetti. They make it a lot easier to understand otherwise rather complicated statistical results, especially when compared to their raw, ugly numerical counterpart. Ugh. I wanted to add a graph to my own website, because without the graph, I have a lot of white space with no actual content to fill it with. And since my website already does some basic record keeping, a graph seems like the perfect way to make things a tad bit more appealing and keep it from looking empty like my DMs. Now the first thing that any sane person would do is go on the internet looking for a library given that anything that has ever been written or ever will be written can be found in the cesspool of ridiculously unnecessary libraries that is NPM. I mean, who hasn't seen the is odd library meme with over half a million weekly downloads? Which is still going strong by the way, I just checked. I also came across this somewhat old article about some stupid string padding library that literally just pads strings with spaces on the left. And it was being used by big name libraries like React and Babel and whatnot. And it broke these libraries due to the package suddenly having been removed from NPM. Understandably so, it shouldn't even have existed in the first place. And I'm not here to tell you that I'm a better programmer because I'm not. I'm just some idiot pressing keys on the computer until something lights up. But I thought to myself, I can do basic math and I can program. And I also hate myself, so I'm going to write it myself. Spoken like a true C programmer. All I see these days is just soy devs everywhere with their funny old MacBooks, sipping latte in the afternoon, doing no real work. You know? Back in my day, we used to write our own text editors that we ran on our own operating systems, compiled with our own handcrafted compilers, running on a computer that we built ourselves by soldering our own... Alright Gary, gotta get back inside man now. Don't worry about him guys, he's just a friendly neckbeard from the 80s living in my closet. Anyways, without wasting any more time on unfunny jokes, it's finally time to write some shit code. First you gotta write your standard HTML5 boilerplate nonsense, Add a reference to our script and we're done. Now it's time to really torture ourselves by writing JavaScript. First things first, we need a setup function where we create a canvas and add it to the root. Now we need to set its width and height. Now with that done, there is a slight situation with high DPI screens such as retina displays for example, where the on-screen pixel units do not map directly to individual physical pixels. So if we don't set the internal resolution of the canvas to the right scale, your graph is going to look like this instead of looking like this. So to amend this problem, we get the screen DPI conveniently provided by the window API, and we set the resolution of our graph to the desired size multiplied by the DPI. Now just doing that will also stretch the graph on the screen, so we have to scale it down by applying the pixel units as the CSS size. Now for drawing things. Before we do that, what kind of graph are we even talking about here? As we all know, there are many different kinds of graphs, like line charts and pie charts and scatter plots, etc. Which are all equally fun, but we're not going to write all of them because I only just need the line chart and that's the easiest one to make since it's the least complicated. Maybe the scatter is a bit simpler because it doesn't have the lines, but whatever line chart it is. Now a few things to notice about the line chart. We have the axes and the labels and the grid lines, and the data points. And to wrap it all up, the lines going through these data points. With that in mind, let's code it up. The first thing that I'm gonna do is write a function to draw individual points on the screen. We set the fill style, begin describing a new path, then mark an ellipse with the given point's location with the given radius. Don't worry about the exact definition of the point type yet, it will soon be clear. Also, this is not the complete code by any means. The full script is very long and I cannot go over all of it, at least not in detail. So if you want to check that out, you can find the GitHub repo in the description. Now finally, we complete the path and fill it. Next up, we define a function to help us draw a line on the screen. We set the line width and the stroke style, which is the color. Uh, we then start describing a path. First, we move our context to the starting coordinate. Think of the context as a brush. Now we describe a line from there to the ending coordinate. We close the path and stroke it, and we have our line. We also need to draw both the axes, so we define a function for doing that. We use our draw line function to draw a line from the bottom left to the bottom right, with the color red and a stroke size of 2. We repeat that for the y-axis, which we draw as a line from the bottom left again to the top left this time. 
We give it a color of blue, but I'm stupid and I made it green instead in the slide, or slides rather. So just treat the color green as if it were blue throughout the whole video. And no, I cannot, or rather won't, edit this because it is like this in over 10 slides, and I am far too tired to go through all of them. Then we draw our label for the x-axis at some offset from the bottom middle. Bounds here is the interior bounds of the graph's internal plotting region, which is made smaller than the actual canvas itself because we need to reserve some space for labels and stuff. For the y-axis we do the same thing, but it looks a bit, I don't know, wrong. So we're going to do it right by drawing a rotated label that aligns itself with the y-axis. To do that, we grab our context, translate it to the left, then rotate it counterclockwise by pi over 2 radians. And finally, draw our text inside. And then we restore our context to a safe point that we created, because otherwise everything else that we draw from here on is also going to be rotated and translated. With that done, we now need to draw the intervals, which we do by first getting the distance between each interval on both the axes. Then, at every interval, we draw the label text, first on the x-axis, then on the y-axis. While we're here, we also want to draw the grid lines for the y-axis at these same intervals. Nice. Now we need a master draw function, where we first draw the axes with the labels, bounds, and the intervals. Then we draw every single point from our data. And finally, the lines through these points. Actually, we want to draw the lines before the points, because otherwise they get drawn over the points and that looks ugly. Now we call this function from our setup function and we're done, right? Uh, no. Because the way our graph is going to end up looking like is this. Which is because we're mapping the raw data points directly to our graph's coordinate system, which is not a good idea. Because the raw data may look like what I have on the screen or maybe even like this. Or anything, really. And when we plot them directly at these points on the graph, of course, they look out of proportions. What we want to do is to transform these points by mapping them to optimally fill the graph. To do that, we first take the leftmost point in the data, and we map that to the leftmost point on the graph. Then we take the bottommost point, which also happens to be the point selected previously, and we map that to the bottommost point on the graph. We do the same thing for the topmost and the rightmost points and then finally transform all of these points by these same proportions. Let's look at the code to do this. We have a transform function that takes in the data, the starting positions, and the width and the height. These are basically the same as the bounds we defined earlier in the draw axes function. They are the bounds of the graph's internal plotting region. We find the min and the max coordinates, get their differences, and divide them by the width and the height of the canvas itself. So if the difference between the two most extreme points are less, then the factor by which we scale down decreases and that scales our points up. If the difference is more, the downscaling factor increases and our points get more tightly squished together. Then we apply this transformation to every point by scaling it by the calculated factor and also translating them to make sure that they remain inside the grass plotting region. And we also don't want to lose the original information, so we keep it as the rich x and y variables for use later if needed. So now our setup function looks like this. First we get the transformed position, and then draw these points. But it's all very boring. I mean, it just sits there, staring at you. What we need is a touch of interactivity. When your mouse hovers on a point, we change its color and make it bigger and draw a little tooltip showing its original value. Similarly, when hovering over a line, we update the line's width, color, and draw a little tooltip, maybe to help distinguish from any other lines that might also get plotted on the same region. To do all of this, we need to go over some basic geometry. The first is the distance between two points, which you should already know from high school. The next is the distance from a point to a line. It's a formula, what else do you want, a proof? Next up, we get the position of the mouse relative to the canvas. First we get the bounds, then we return the mouse move events x and y coordinates with the canvas's offset subtracted from it. We write another function that checks if any of the points or lines in our graphs is being hovered on. So now the updated draw function looks something like this. We draw the points with a different color and size if hovered. And we do the same for the lines. 
Now we need to draw our tooltip upon hover. So we start by describing a new path. We get the original data to be drawn inside the tooltip and measure the text size so that we can draw a new rounded rectangle that can fit this information inside it. We calculate the width and the height from the measured text size. Then we mark a round rectangle by calling the provided canvas API call. Finally set the fill and the stroke styles and draw the tooltip container. And at last we draw the text inside it. Now we need a way to do this whenever the mouse moves, so we add a new mouse move event listener to our canvas. And from inside the listener we get the mouse position, get the hover states, and finally redraw our graph. This is what it looks like in action. Uh, that's about it. Bye.